So, but we're in Genesis chapter uh, 26 tonight. Um, I'm wearing the hat because I got a really short haircut, and uh, I know that's vanity, isn't it? But with the lights coming right down on top, I, I look bald. Now, there's nothing wrong with being bald, but I just, I'm not there yet, and it looks like I am. And also to remind you to buy one of the refuge uh, hats that we have back there as well. The other apology I have is my dirty face, and I'm just growing the shepherd out. I'm getting ready for the the uh, shepherd presentation this year. I'm going to be back on. I'll, I'll give you guys the um, the itinerary so you can be praying for me in these different places. About every other year, I end up uh, just by invitation. I don't I don't try to set these things up, but by invitation, I end up doing a little bit of traveling, and I'll be back on the East Coast in South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and then stopping in Dallas on the way back to uh, to visit with Shaddy. Many of you remember Shaddy and Isabel um, Francis who are pastoring there in Irving, Texas, a church called Lifeline. And you can look them up, Calvary Chapel Lifeline, as they, I think is what it's called. Doing a, a wonderful job back there. So anyway, I'm in the process, and it's going to look just like a dirty face here for a while, but uh, it's on the way. So Genesis 26. Now that you've turned 26, I want to draw your attention back to 25 for a while. I just really felt after we um, concluded last Wednesday then I just felt like we need to linger in chapter 25 a little bit longer with the story of the twins. How many of you have twins? Any, any, any moms in here uh, have twins? Are there any twins here? How many are? How, anybody here is a twin? Where? Where? Oh, you have twins. Yes, that's right. In the back. Yeah. Anybody else have twins or are a twin? Anybody have twins in your family? Anybody wish you were a twin? Um, they're twins in, in my family, in my uh, cousin's. And they were absolutely identical twins, and they did some of those, uh, those tricky things of, of uh, changing classrooms on teachers and pulling tricks on boyfriends to a certain degree when they were young. But uh, these two twins couldn't have pulled that off because they were not identical twins, Esau and Jacob, and we talked about that last week. But though the, the theme for tonight is a little bit different, in, in 26, we will get into 26 I, I believe before God we will make it into chapter 26 tonight. We'll see how that goes. But I've given that, uh, that chapter the, sort of the overriding theme of Lord have mercy. <laughs> because he's, God, had, you know, God has nothing to work with to do anything he wants to do here on this earth through people. He has nothing to work with except broken people. Amen? amen. If you didn't say amen, look around the room just a little bit. Because all you're looking at is broken people. And God gets some marvelous things done through broken people. He can do beautiful things through broken people. I heard this story, and, and I had been in London before I heard this story, and I really want to get back to London one day to verify this story. I believe it's about St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, which was bombed during the, um, the bombing of London during the Second World War. And as there was so much ruin all over, you know, both the continent and in the British Isles as well. But the story goes that when St. Paul's was, uh, was, was hit, um, just incredible damage, obviously, but a beautiful stained glass window that had been there for, I, I don't even remember how long, but it was just absolutely magnificent. And it was all just in shattered pieces down on the floor among all the other block and stone and timber that had fallen in. And you would think they'd just bring the, the old form of bulldozers in there and tear the thing down, but they didn't. And they didn't give up on the stained glass window. Do you know how long it took them to put that window back together exactly like it was? Well, they never did. They didn't do it. But what they did is they took all those little shards of glass that were laying in a heap and they reassembled a very different window. It was just a mosaic of a colorful pieces of glass now broken and broken into smaller pieces and today they said it is still just a magnificent masterpiece every time i think about that or i see a repurposed anything i think about how that is exactly what god does with us god doesn't have any unbroken material to work with in building his church or getting anything done so as you're watching the story of redemption unfold here in the early pages of the Bible, it is on that theme we talked about last week. 
It's against all odds that God got anything done through broken, sinful people like you and I. But look at the history of the world. He did. Now, we're talking about the history of redemption, but look at the amazing things he does through anybody who says, God, here's my life. And like Aileen Coleman, I've got to just quote Aileen tonight. Aileen Coleman, who was with us a couple of weeks ago, she said she came to that point in her life where she said, God, I'm tired of living for Aileen Coleman. It's time, I think 21 years old is when she got saved. It's time that Aileen Coleman lives for Jesus. And God's done a beautiful thing through her. So the theme that I started last week carries on through the whole story of salvation against all odds. It's just one aspect of that rescue story that is our true story. Every time you look in the mirror, you're looking at something that God, something, someone, someone that God has chosen to use, chosen to pour his favor out upon, but chosen to use for his glory. If you and if I will just say, okay, God, I'm going to put all the brokenness that is me in your hands today. Has anybody got any brokenness? Is your arm too tired to even lift it up tonight? You're that broken? But if you'll put that in God's hands every single day and, and live with that surrender to him, wait till you see what he does. But the reason this story unfolds against all odds is three powerful basic truths. I want you to write them down if you're taking any notes tonight. The reason God does a, a beautiful thing through us is because of these three absolute truths, and they all exist at the same exact time. You won't like the first one. You might like the second one. You, you might hate the second one a little bit less than you hate the first one, but the third one is really good. Number one is this. The whole story that unfolds against all odds is due to these three basics. Number one, our enemy's cruelty. Satan's cruelty and his sadistic, evil, relentless nature and his determination to destroy every single one of you, me included. And he is determined to do that. You put that alongside with truth number two, and this is about you and me. It's our own inherited fallen nature and our total inability to save ourselves. Now listen, if you haven't come to this realization yet in, in your life, then I would have to say, as graciously as I can, if you're still very determined to save yourself, then you're not saved yet. Because you cannot save yourself. And when you rest in the truth that you are unable to save yourself, and even though the enemy may be on your heels, determined, like, the, like Jesus said, to rob and to kill and to destroy you, the good news, the good news of these three basic truths is coming your way right now. Anybody ready for good news right now? After the horrible news and the bad news, and it's this, that our perfect fathers our, our father's perfect love and capability to save us all in spite of ourselves and that's why there's a story of redemption yes there's an evil enemy i mean a sadistically evil enemy who loves to cause hurt and harm and bring shame and destruction and yes we're unable to really do anything to save ourselves even in that mess now you can improve your life but you can't save your soul on your own but your loving heavenly father is the only, only one that's capable of saving you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together to draw you to Jesus whose blood saves you by the love of our Father in heaven. Amen? So all of those go together. So against all odds, God is keeping his promises to save the world. So against all odds, and here's where we've been. Against all odds, where we started with Abraham, against all odds, God kept Abraham from destruction. And we've seen him already get in trouble. We've seen him go deeper and deeper, and in, in one sense, further and further, further from the perfect will of God. Has anybody here ever gotten outside of the will of God? Yeah, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I hear some people laughing. Who hasn't gotten outside of the will of God? I don't know anybody that has, has walked every single step in life right in, in the footsteps of Jesus. You know, we've all messed up. But against all odds, God kept Abraham from destruction. And secondly, this one man that we've met, now we've been with him for a while, Isaac, against all odds, Isaac survives in the middle of all the hostility as well. He shouldn't have survived. There was hostility be between him and his, his half-brother. There was hostility in the region. Nobody liked them as they were moving through. They didn't have a, a, a square foot of land or a hectare or an acre or whatever. They, didn't they had nothing they could, could call their own. The people in the region allowed them to live here, allowed them to live there, sometimes let them pass through, sometimes wouldn't give them water. But against all odds... 
Isaac survived in the middle of all of that hostility. And as we're going to see in the next phase of this, as we walk through the life now of, of Jacob, against all odds, Rebekah's womb has been opened to carry the next runner in this relay race that leads us from here to where? Where, where is this relay race of redemption leading us to? Calvary. To the cross. To the cross of Calvary. And then into a tomb tucked away for a long weekend. And then he comes out. Powerful story of redemption. Then, against all odds, both of the twins will survive each other too. Esau and Jacob. But I want to look again for just a minute, back in chapter 25, at this war that was in the womb between these guys. Can I read those four verses to you again? Five verses. Verse 22 in Genesis. Are you guys in Genesis? Good, I'll get there with you. Verse 22. Now, uh, it, it, it's, this is, this is um, Rebecca who's about to speak. And God had opened her womb. And now there's babies where there was nothing but barrenness for the, the first part of their marriage. And it says that uh, the children struggle together within her. That means they're fighting before they're born. Now, I don't know what it's like. Moms that have had, had the babies. It, it, Golden, did, did that happen? Was it, did it sound some, feel sometimes like they were wrestling on the inside? Yep. There we have it. You can put a check mark by there, true. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, and if this is good, she's saying, then why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And I love this conversation the Lord has with her. She has said something to the Lord. She inquires of the Lord. In other words, she has a conversation, and the Lord talks back to her. Verse 23, the Lord said to her, well, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people, one nation in other words, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And so when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, and we've talked about this, he was like a, a hairy garment all over, so they gave him a name that meant Harry, and that was Esau. So Harry was Harry. Verse 26, and after his, afterward his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, who's already been born. So his name was called Jacob, the heel catcher. Really creative names in those days. Harry was called Harry, and the heel catcher was called heel catcher. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And Father, I just pray as we move back into this passage tonight, still so full of thoughts, Lord. I know we won't exhaust it even this evening, but Lord, would you bless us and teach us as we take your word seriously tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The rest of the story is a fulfillment of the prophecy. The rest of the story of these two boys is, a, a, is an explicit fulfillment of what God said to, to, uh, to, uh, to Rachel, to Mama. Did I get that right? Rebecca. Rebe I, how many, anybody else but me ever mix up Rebecca and Rachel? And it, ever get it wrong on a quiz? I would still be getting it wrong on quizzes because I'm really typical, I'm, I'm terrible with names. But the prophecy that was given to Rebecca, you're going to watch it being fulfilled page after page after page for a while as these boys are at odds with one another. They fought in the womb. And then, then at their birth, there's, there's you know, Isaac reaching out to say, not so fast, Harry, as he reaches out to grab his heel. And then the twins went opposite directions in their interests. There's the mighty hunter, and there's, I guess you could call him the master chef, who learned how to cook. And maybe there were times where they worked together, where, where big brother, by just a tiny bit, he brought some meat home and... And uh, Isaac, who'd been learning from mom, possibly, maybe even dad, how to cook, he would, he would whip up something wonderful. But one became the hunter out in the field, and the other was the chef, and the division in the family due to that game of favorites that mom and dad played. We talked about that at some length last week. We don't need to go over that again. But just this, put this verse beside it, and later on, go read the first part of James chapter 4. It says, where do these wars come from within us? Well, they come from us. They come from our passions and our desires that war against us in our midst. My passion or jealousy or lust or greed or thirst for, for power or position, it'll, it will always bring war. 
That's why political elections are never nice. I've never heard of a nice one. And they're even, that. well, I don't know what it's like today in Australia, but they were, they were even worse down there. The name-calling and even the antics in Parliament were, anybody ever watch any parliamentary debates? I mean, they get, they get nasty there. But that, that's politics because there's power. There's something that's on offer. And Jacob, finally at this point, the war is not over for this guy. But he finally has, and I think this is where we ended last week, Jacob finally has what he's been after all this time in his life up to this point. He wanted that top position. He wanted the birthright, and he got the birthright. And from this point on, he's just the happiest guy in the park. No, he's not. Because even though he had what he wanted, he still wasn't satisfied. How many of you have lived long enough to know that that's true? The passion that drives you to get something will never be satisfied when you got it because there'll be something else that you've got a passion for. You'll keep saying what? What's that four-letter word? Starts with an M. More. Just give me more, 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 more power, more whatever it is. Just give me more. When Jacob never embraced the rank that he was in as second, he, he would not settle down into second. And I read some stuff this week about this. That, that suggested that maybe it wasn't just in Jacob's mind. Maybe somebody was fueling that passion and reminding him about the prophecy that God had given his, his who? His mama. And the suggestion, who do you think the, the suggested party that's whispering in his ear is? Maybe it's mama saying, look, look. You deserve more than this. And I don't know why, and I'm not saying it's exactly the same thing, but you see the mother of James and John coming to Jesus, sort of doing, hey, can I, Jesus, could you and I have a talk? I would really love it if you would let my two boys be one on your right and one on your left, like your two captains when you come into your kingdom, your two vice presidents when you become president. Would you let, and she's just campaigning for powerful seats for them. She's doing what she can to get them promoted. And I love the way that Jesus handles that, but that's a totally different story. But mom might have fueled this discontent. She remembered the prophecy. And we know what happens not very far down the road into their life. She loves Jacob and and, and Isaac loves Esau. And they were divided on which was which. Now maybe Esau was the favored one because Isaac knew well he's going, he's going, he's in line for the throne. He's in line to be the chief of the tribe. So I'm going to pour into him because he's the successor. And that's how it should have been, just by, by, nat- by the natural flow of things. But have you ever noticed that when you read the history of the nation of Israel, it doesn't say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Because that all changes right here. The second born would become the one that held the power of the birthright, and it's a powerful thing. But I can just imagine the conversations that that Mama, Rebecca, might have had with her son that she favored so much. Jacob, honey, just just wait a while. Just wait a while. All of this is going to be yours one day. Just give it time, honey, because God has spoken, and she's got, so to speak, Scripture. I don't know that it was in Scripture form at that point, but she's got... The, the spoken word of God, that the younger one will be head over the older one. And then, as I said last week, once upon a time, Jacob's opportunity arrived, and he jumped on it. Esau comes home from the hunt with nothing, nothing, you know, over his shoulder, and nothing except a growling stomach. And who knows how long he'd been out on the hunt. But he has, the, this, the way he describes it, he says, I'm ready to die of hunger. You and I have said that, die of hunger, dying, I'm dying of thirst, and and we're not. We're we're, we're nowhere close to that, I'm sure. But maybe he was. Maybe he'd been out for days and days and days and didn't take enough food to, to last him as long as it took to hunt until he gave up and he comes back and he is starving, he thinks. He's famished. And so the deal, Esau sells his birthright for a bowl of vegetable foe. Or something like that. And I know I dispronounced, I, I know I mispronounced, I dispronounced, I dispronounced, mispronounced while I was dispronouncing foe or whatever. But the expected lineage of the story changes at this point. 
And the big brother comes home and he sells it out for a bowl of stew. We talked about how silly that was of him at that point. But we hear at the end of the story, he despised his birthright. And the birthright meant a whole lot more in those days than just cash, more than wealth and more than the pride of sort of the, the, the Oval Office, picturing yourself there. And I just found, out, found this out today. Anybody know the name of the desk that's been used by most presidents since about the 1970s, I think it was? Anybody know that? The Resolute Desk. It's the one that Kennedy used, where you see the pictures of little John John poking his head through there. And it's not the idea of just the pride of the office and the pride of wearing the title, and you got your feet up on the Resolute Desk because you finally made it. The birthright had so much more to do with being the carrier, especially in this context. Listen carefully. The carrier of the promise. The carrier of the treasure of the promise of salvation for the whole world. The calling and the purpose and the responsibility. And, and, and there's been, like I said, from the beginning of this, there's been nobody that's been really worthy of that. Yet all God has to work with is a guy named Abraham who used to be a an idol worshiper, at least in an idol worshiping tribe. And he's got a scoundrel, and he's got all the way down. He's got nothing to work with except imperfect people. There were no perfect candidates for any office, and there still are no perfect candidates for any office. We, we know about Jacob's flaws. We're going to see more of Esau's flaws tonight. Well, maybe not by the, I don't think we'll make it to the end of chapter 26. But here's the big picture. I want to spend a little bit of time on this. You might want to take a couple of notes on this. Here, here's the big picture. We are the ones that painted ourselves into a deeper corner than we were born into. At least I did. I don't know if anybody else is like me, any sinners in the room, where you painted yourself, you were born at a disadvantage. You were born with a terminal disease that the Bible calls sin. It takes the life of all of us, 100%. And, and yet by our actions and by our choices, we painted ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper into a corner. And we ended up more and more, I think it's fair to say, lost. And salvation was beyond the reach of any of us. But God allowed all this trouble that we've been reading in, in the story, he allowed all this trouble and this diversion from the perfect will to, so that he could show his perfect power and his perfect wisdom. So that, so that at the end of the day, how many songs have this phrase in it? that we would all say, glory to what? Glory to God. Glory to God. God is the only one that deserves the glory for our salvation. He's the only one that deserves the applause for our rescue because we were, in, we were absolutely incapable of rescuing ourselves. Now, I want to open up this conversation not that we're going to talk back and forth a whole lot, but I'm more than willing to talk with, this about, talk with you about this afterwards. There are some phrases that float around in Christian circles that are, are and, and they're very thoughtful phrases. In other words, I mean, they've been thought through to mean something specific. And sometimes they're, they're very... Um, they're, they're welcome phrases. Sometimes they're very, very helpful. Sometimes I think they're a little bit misleading. And this is one of those phrases I want to talk about that I think is a little bit misleading. Now, don't anybody leave because, like I said, I'm more than happy to talk about this after the service. Is anybody nervous right now? Is anybody wondering where? You know, let's just call it off tonight and let's all know. No. Many people insist... And I've, I've heard this phrase a lot in the last probably 10 years or so. They insist that the gospel can be found on every page of Scripture or every verse of Scripture. And I believe that that's an overstatement. There is no question that the gospel is promised, the good news is promised at the beginning when the bad news comes into play and we've fallen into, into to ruin. But the idea that the, the, the gospel is on every single page, that's only partially true. And I'm going to tell you how, the, the part that I think is, is maybe, maybe, maybe even a better way to say that, a more helpful way to say that for, for what it's worth. Yeah, you can, you can see the inability of man to save himself. Is that the whole gospel? No, that's not the whole gospel. 
That's the beginning of the problem being stated. You can see the inability of man to save himself, and you see it over and over and over again through Scripture. So I can take you to those places like we're seeing here. And that's the beginning of the story that leads to the good news, and where it, it teaches us beyond a shadow of a doubt that none are worthy and no one is capable of saving themselves. Not Abraham, Isaac, Harry, or heel catcher. None of them could have been by themselves worthy or become the Savior. The bloodline would lead through them, but it didn't just lead to them. Here's the, here's the phrase that I think needs some rethinking. It's the phrase total depravity of man. Anybody ever heard the term total depravity? If you look up the word depravity in Scripture and put total in front of it, I think it says something about human beings that the Bible doesn't say. I do believe that the, the inability of man, the total inability of man, is probably a much, much better term and a more biblical term to say all men are, are absolutely unable to save themselves, but to say totally depraved, the word depraved means it has the connotation of just nasty people, morally decrepit people, the kind of people you would never want to spend a weekend with. How many of you have good friends and, and, and family members that you love to spend time with, that aren't saved, let me, let me qualify that, that are not saved, but you still love to hang out with them, then they're not, by, by the typical definition of the word total and depraved put together, they're not totally depraved, they're lost. And there's some wonderful lost people in the world that still can't save themselves. All I'm saying is, is, is let's examine these sound bites that we pass around, these verbal memes that we pass from one to another before we tack them up on the walls of our mind and, and make sure that they really are truly biblical. The total depravity takes the truth of man further than the Bible does. Yeah, we're all unrighteous. That doesn't mean we're all serial killers. That doesn't mean we're all serial adulterers and adulteresses. That doesn't mean that we're all sadists and, and just wicked, wicked people that, that need to be dealt with by our laws. Uh, yeah, we're all unrighteous, and yes, none of us can save ourselves. It is not in us to save us. Everybody say that with me. It is not in us to save us. It's not in ourselves to save us. We don't qualify for that job. And yes, you see the righteousness of God over and over and over again on, on page after page after page. That's a part of the gospel, that by the righteousness of God in Christ, he reaches the unrighteous in order to save them. And yeah, you see again and again and again the rescuing hand of God comes in countless times, even before it, it's dealing with eternal salvation. How many of you love those stories in Scripture where God just reaches down and he gets somebody out of a mess that they made? See, that's the strong, strong arm of God. And I love that, that passage. One day I'm going to memorize the, uh, the reference for it. The passage, it says, his arm is not short, that it cannot save. His arm is not short that it cannot save. Um, I was taking a, a picture a couple of days ago um, out here on the courtyard. Uh, Rachel uh, Rosenberg, who's uh, on our staff with her husband Caleb, uh, she's taken pictures of our you know, staff, and, and uh, she's a great photographer. That was her major in college. and said, I'm going to follow you out, and I'm going to steal your pose of, of Isaac and Alyssa, whom she was taking pictures of. And so I just hovered over her sh shoulder and took, I let her do the hard work and I did the easy work of taking the picture. And then I said, hey, let me jump up there and get a little bit closer with it. So I took a few pictures and Alyssa said, is that on portrait? And I didn't even think about putting it on portrait because it's better on portrait. So I put it on portrait and then I thought, I wonder if I could take a picture myself on portrait. And I realized my arm is too short to take my own picture on portrait because you have to be further along. But God could do that. God's, uh, that has, that, that's a silly illustration. God's arm is not short. He can reach you in your mess. Does that, does that encourage anybody tonight? He's not unaware of the mess you've created for yourself. He's not incapable of reaching you. He's not powerless against whatever forces are holding you down. He loves to set free the oppressed from whatever has, is crushing them at, at, at any moment. God's rescuing hand is still reaching us. And we see it countless times through Scripture. You see death and resurrection over and over again through Scripture, which are a foreshadow of the resurrection of Jesus, the death 
and the resurrection of Jesus. You see it so many times through Scripture, playing out personally as well as nationally. And you see God overcoming the impossible over and over and over again. It, it, it is, without a question, the most incredible comeback in the history of, uh, of humanity. It's an even greater comeback than the Patriots against the Falcons in Super Bowl 2017 or Super Bowl 51 when, oh, let's not talk about that. That was just oh, unbelievable. But it's what, what an amazing comeback when Christ bears our sin, dies as a sacrificial lamb, and then rises from the dead. Nobody, not even the disciples that he had trusted and told them that he would be back. And not even the women who came weeping to the tomb. Nobody expected to see him alive again. It's the most amazing comeback. Is the gospel, is the full gospel found on every page of scripture? Well, no, it's not. But let me put it like this to you. But you can easily get to the gospel from any page of scripture. Because the whole story from beginning to end is somewhere along that line from our brokenness, our lostness, all the way to the offer of salvation. And you can find that on every page of Scripture that will lead you from where you might find yourself on whatever page or paragraph right to the cross. And you can get to the cross from there. So be careful about passing on the meme. Examine it and think it through before you tack it up on the wall of your mind or your heart or put it on your dashboard. Now, Back to Genesis 25 and 26. We have a rift in the chosen family. Have you noticed that? There's breakdown. There's dysfunction. Does that give anybody in here hope to know that God can intervene in dysfunctional families? It's all he's, really in one way, that's all he's done. Some suggest, like I said, that, that Mama Rebecca interfered in order to put her favored son into the, in, in, into the chief's tent. I guess you could call it the oval tent if you want to. Whispered conversations based on the prophecy, reminding Jacob and, and maybe even Isaac and Esau that he's going to be the chief one day. Can you imagine that? Even the conversation between Rebekah and Isaac as he's talking about his favorite son. And she's talking about Jacob and the promise that was given concerning Jacob. But honey, Isaac, honey, you know what God said. Something's going to happen. And one day, Isaac, or one day Jacob, is going to be ahead of Esau. Somehow, he will be the one that will rule. And it's just an amazing thing. Rebecca is definitely guilty of collusion by the time you get to chapter 27, helping with the, the setup, but we'll get there when we get there. So when Esau comes home hungry, Jacob did what Jacob does. Like so many siblings. How many of you had sibling rivalries growing up? Did you, did you have arguments over bunk beds? Who gets the top? Who's stuck on the bottom? Did you have that? With, uh, my brother and I had that all the time. Who got the top bunk? Dibs on, shotgun, or fighting over the biggest pork chop or whatever it is, and that sibling rivalry or the biggest pudding, you know, especially the pudding that mom made. Oh, my gosh, she made the most amazing ranch pudding. But it was always coughing. Five hungry kids around the table, and these are just two guys. So the stakes are way higher here. He shows up, and not, not to spend too much more time in this, he shows up hungry, and Jacob says, yeah, I can help you out. I can feed that hunger for you. It's going to cost you. He said, pay me. Pay me. He says, okay, I'll pay you. And then he says, swear to God that you will pay me. Make an oath. Make a vow that you will pay me. And with that, whatever words were spoken after that, even if there were no more words except, okay, okay, I swear before God, it's yours. And what good is it to me now that I'm about to die anyway? With that, it was gone. Now, because we're not done with Jacob, let me just give you a, a, a warning. There's more of this Jacob before there's going to be a new Jacob. There's more of this guy. And, and, and he's going he's gonna to get a new name just like his, his, uh, his grandpa got a new name. But he's... Uh, that we're going to see him over and over again like this. It's so typical of him. It's typical of Esau, too. You'll see that at the end of the chapter. They're just being typical. Really, they're just being typical. I, I'm uh, listening through uh, a book that I must have started on Audible about three or four years ago. And I finally got to the place where I was looking for this one paragraph or one exchange. It's a now, I've never read anything big by Dostoevsky, 
because he writes big books and they scare me. But I'm listening through it. And I think I'm about maybe a 25% of the way through it after listening for about four hours or so on my walks in the morning. But it, it's, a, it's an intriguing thing where there's this. So one of the main characters, of the main character, the book is called The Idiot. I don't know what drew me, drew me to that one. It just seemed like it was calling my name. It was The Idiot. And, uh, but there's this main character, Prince Mishkin, and another one of the main characters is a character who's called Rogozhin. Mishkin is a very gentle soul who's been away at some sort of a, a hospital to help him deal with anxieties. And he's come back from Switzerland and he's back in Russia thinking he might, he might want to get to know his family. And as he gets to know this family, they are a mess. And especially this guy, Rogozhin. And there's, of course, there's a love interest. And, uh, oh, I can't think of her name right now, but uh, she's the love interest, and they're both kind of interested, but Rogozhin's really interested in her. And so there's this encounter, and Rogozhin, who's a little bit of a bully and a very arrogant man and has more money than he really knows what to do with, he starts to rage against his sister. And, uh, and, and the woman is in the room, too, and there's a handful of people. And Mishkin, just a real gentle guy, he stops in and he catches his hand before he can hit his sister and he says no i will not let you do that and so what rogozhin does is he hauls off and he smacks mishkin as hard as he can and he's so disoriented and he kind of goes off in the corner he doesn't pout but he goes off in the corner and the next thing you see is an encounter between these two and there's a, a and I, I want you to, th this will make sense in a second but rogozhin says something like this you must think me a scoundrel because of what I did to you. And I, I'll never forget this, but I wrote it down so I could read it as it was actually said. He said, no, I don't see you as a scoundrel. You are just the most ordinary man that could ever be, and very weak, and not original. In other words, he was saying, you're just typical. You just do what men like you do. And there couldn't have been a worse insult to this man. He didn't cuss him out. He said, no, you're not a you're not a scoundrel. There's nothing original about you, and you're just typical, and you're weak. You gave in to your emotions. Well, that's who, uh, that's who, who um, Jacob and Esau both are. They're just doing what they do, and it continues, and I get, I'd have to say it, gets, it really does. It gets worse and worse, and that's why I said as we begin chapter 26 and just spend a few minutes in it, the title I put over this is, Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. What a mess. God, can you get anything good out of this? And wait till you see what he has to do to get something wonderful out of it. Look at verse 1 and 2. And I hope that helped to put all of this in, in a, a little bit better context. It says, There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. You probably have in the margin of your Bible Genesis chapter 12. And that's, when he had, that's when Abraham had his famine. There was a famine in the land besides the first one that Abraham had. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. There's a lot in that. And, uh, and, and it's this. Every one of the, the three patriarchs had their famine. You've got your challenge. A lot of us have typical challenges that every Christian has to go through. Temp, temp what? Temptations that are drawing you, drawing me in the wrong direction, making the wrong choices. Abraham had that temptation. Isaac is facing that temptation right now. And Jacob is going to face that temptation. And it'll be a very different situation when he is facing the famine and he goes to Egypt. And what he goes down there to do, do you know what it is? To save a lost boy, Joseph. But I'm getting way, way ahead of myself by, by about 20 chapters here. But, but the famines, 13 famines in Scripture. Two of them are in the New Testament. Most of them, obviously, then the other 13 are here in the Old Testament. It comes during the time of the kings. It happens during the time of the prophets. There's always going to be something. You won't like this. There's always going to be something that tests your faith and, and one other thing, it's the big O word. What is it? Obedience to God. When God says do this, there's always going to be a test of that obedience. 
You, you won't live long without a test for that obedience because God is faithful to test us in those things. And the question is, where do we run when our famine hits or our temptation to go get our supply of whatever we're, we're wanting to feed ourselves? Where do we run in those temptations? Well, Isaac, it's very interesting. He begins to retrace his father's steps, not in order. He goes to Gerar first. Abraham had gone to Gerar. Why would he go to Gerar? Because there was family connection down there. Let me show you something up here on the screen, just very briefly. This is uh, the, you, it's, well, you can see the red over here on this screen better, and then look back to it here if that's a better screen for you. But down here, way over off to the, to the bottom right, is where Abraham started in the Ur of the Chaldees. And look at the journey this guy has been through when he comes into the land. And then when the famine hits, he does. He goes down to Egypt, and it wasn't a good idea. And then he comes back up out of Egypt and he ends up in Gerar. And as he settles down into Gerar, there's a, um, a sort of a pact that he makes with Abimelech. And we'll talk more about him in just a little bit. But here's maybe a little bit closer look to where we are now with, uh, with Isaac. When the, when the famine hits, he's moved from up around the area where his, his mother was buried and has gone down to live in Bier Lahairoi. La, La That's the place where he chose to settle at a well there. And when the famine hits, he's closer to going to Egypt or maybe al almost exactly the same distance. But instead of going to Egypt, maybe because he remembers daddy's story and the foolish decision that was. He, instead of going off to the, to the west and then down to the south, he goes northeast and he goes to the land of Gerar because he knows that there's a story there. There was family history. In Genesis 20, Abraham went there after Sodom and Gomorrah. He got as, as far away from Sodom and Gomorrah as he could going towards the, the land of promise. And so he's down to what would become the, 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 the area of the tribe of Judah and, and while he's there, he makes a pact with the leaders, and we've been through this. He makes a pact with Abimelech, who is probably not the name, it's, it's more like the title for the, the king, the local king. And then Phicol, you'll see that name as well in both stories, is more like the title for the general. It's not the same two people or two people by the same you know, given name. It's a king and his commander in both stories that are there. But it, it is so much the story, you've heard this before, <laughs> and you follow the family around, and you can quite often see this, like father, like son. And, and here comes the famine, and you know, how many of you believe God ever wastes his words? Never wastes his words. And so when God says to, to Jacob, as he finds him there in Gerar, he said, you know, this is good. This is better than going to Egypt. He said, just settle down right here. But he says, don't go to Egypt but live in the land of which I shall tell you and dwell in this land, he says in verse 3. I, I think it's God, again, like I said, not wasting his words. He knows. He knows what, what, what Jacob or, or, or what Isaac's thinking. He knows what he's thinking. I, maybe, I, maybe I should go to Egypt. Maybe I should just give up on this. And maybe I should go to Egypt. And so God, who knows what he's thinking, can I get it personal? God, who knows what you're thinking? Who knows what I'm thinking? I, oh, he has a way to get through to your heart to say to you, no, don't go to, put in the brackets, to your Egypt. No, don't go there. Don't, 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 go, don't walk the way daddy walked if it led him over a cliff, if it led him into bondage, if it led him into ruin. I know a lot of you saw this, uh, this uh, photograph that was up on, uh, it's been circulating around for a while on social media, and I can't remember the boy's name, but it's been reposted by a bunch of people. It's a picture of a young man when he looked like a strong young athlete. And then it's what he looks like a couple of years later after heroin and meth got a hold of him. And he's a skeleton of what he had been. I was heading that same direction as a 17-year-old kid after two years of just putting everything anybody handed me into my system. And every step that I would take, and I'm not exaggerating, it was painful. It wasn't just my bones that ached. I could feel the effect of the drugs and the speed that was in them and just the garbage and the chemicals I was putting into my body that don't belong in a human body. It just felt like my teeth were going to fall out of my head if I didn't keep my teeth clenched. 
It's just the ruin. Like father, like son. Daddy drank, I'll drink. Daddy smoked pot, I'll smoke pot. Daddy had a stack of porn, I'll have a stack of porn. And it was just, you know, and, and it's like father, like son here. The kids knew Abraham's stories. Both of them did. They knew grandpa's stories. They knew their own dad's stories. In fact, I can, I can imagine grandma saying, did I ever tell you the time about when your daddy and I went down to Egypt? Did I ever tell you about what happened when we went in, into Gerar among, among Abimelech? She said, it wasn't, they weren't good stories. And so God says, no, you stay. You go where I lead you. Don't go back to Egypt. Not now. You don't belong in Egypt. Now look at verse 3. Verses 3 to 6, and then we'll probably, we'll see if we get any further than that. Verses 3 to 6, the promise passes to the son. Now this is the beginning of something that gets so good by the time we get to chapter 28. There's a, there's a, a phrase that I can't wait to hear God say it to this man. Um, it says this, Then dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands. And you could almost put in the sides, eventually they'll take possession of it. But I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Now watch the passing of the blessing. He says, here's what I said to Abraham. Now listen to how God is saying it to him. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statues, statutes, and my laws. And so Isaac stayed put. He dwelt there in Gerar. And that's going to be repeated to him again. It's going to be repeated to Jacob as well, because the blessing is passed on to all these imperfect people, just like you and I. We get to carry the promise of God of eternal life. The promise of God of his absolute, outrageous, undeserved blessing upon us as beloved sons that have found favor in his sight. And that this, this passage, which is repeated a couple of times to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob, it had to have been like a song to them to hear those. And fathers would pass it to their their sons and their daughters and to their bride as they married and it would go to the next generation. Do you know what God has said about us? All this land that right now is not ours, don't know how it's going to happen, but one day he will fulfill his word to us. And they lived with a, a, a firm, well, when, let me put it like this, when they lived with a firm grasp on that promise of God, do you know what it gave them? It gave them hope. You know what else it gave them? Give me peace. Now, how many of you have ever wondered? You don't have to lift up your hands. I'll wear you guys out all the times I ask you to lift up your hands. But how many of you have found that peace from God because of what He said to you in His Word? Because of, because of who He says you are. We, have, we sing a wonderful song about that. I am who I, He says I am. And I have to embrace that. He calls me son. Yes, I get to serve Him too. But He calls me son. And friend, Jesus calls me a friend of his, a child of God. And that's an amazingly wonderful place to rest your head every single day and every night, to rest upon the promise of God. This had to be just like a beautiful symphony every time that promise was repeated, that God has given us this amazing promise. Well, let, let's go just a couple more verses. You got a couple more verses in you? Yeah, okay, I won't go in much further than that, all right? I'll save some of this for next week. But that, though, that was the first, the first big test. And he passed the first test. He didn't go down to Egypt. Let, let, come on, let, let's hear it for Isaac. He didn't go down to Egypt. Well done, Isaac. Next big test, not so good. Verse 7. And the men of the place asked about his wife. And he said, oh, she's my sister. Oh, here we go again. What was that like? Father, like son? Abraham did it twice. He says, let's see, what is dad doing in situations like this? She's my sister. Even if it's a half-truth, it's not right. For he was afraid to say she's my wife because he thought lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca because she's beautiful to behold. And, and now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, again the king, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw and there was Isaac showing endearment 
to Rebekah, his wife. There are some translations that get a little more graphic on the way he showed endearment to his wife, but they were caressing. And I guess you could say they were, kind of, they were making out, I'm sure. That, that seems to be the idea. You don't, you don't hug your, your sister like that. And so whatever it was, it was obvious that it was the kind of affection that you show to a wife. And then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she, don't you want a threatening voice right there? Quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say she's my sister? Isaac said to him, well, because, no, I shouldn't go there. <laughs> because, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you could tell they wanted her. They would have lain with your wife, and, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And now he's got protection. But there's a better way to get that protection. Just rest in God. And they did it again. The next big test and initially he failed it. Dad taught his son how to live in hostile territory with a pretty wife. And it wasn't the way to teach him. Just lie about it. Don't trust me. Just don't trust God. Just lie about it. And he failed that test. And I think he failed it miserably, but just like Dad did, but God saved it. Now, when it was, uh, when it was Abraham in Egypt, it was God that revealed to, uh, to the Pharaoh and his people, that, that, that he had, had this terrible dream, and then when it was the other Abimelech, it was the same thing. God had somehow revealed it to him. But this is just a king who sees it and says, bring that boy in here. I've got to talk to him. Who do you think you are to bring ruin upon us like that? It almost seems to me like Abimelech has as much faith in the justice of God, maybe even more than, than Jacob did at that point or than Isaac did. I'm, I'm going to mix up their names from here on out. Just trust me. I know I'll do it. You'll get it straight as you read it. But it's, it's, it's like the, the pagan who's following a false god has more understanding about the justice of God and what's right and what's wrong than even the man of God. And he's going to have a name, and we'll talk about it, and maybe not next time, but, but pretty soon when, when we get together again around these texts. But the, the point is, and you can close your Bible up because I need to finish tonight you will be tested too and i will be tested every day as we attempt by the grace of god to stay on course and god won't overrule your your freedom to choose and i'm glad that he doesn't because that makes it so much more valuable when you obey god and when i obey god when i trust in his word to be true and I trust in his strength to be enough. And I trust in his love for me to give me exactly what I need, including the tests that sometimes, well, most times, I wish he wouldn't give me. But he does it for this one reason, to make me like him. We're tr we're, when we're tempted, when we're tried, and we endure in the midst of the temptation, we come out looking more like him. Have you noticed that? And, you, and obviously you come out the other side of that saying, oh God, thank you for keeping me through that trial. So I'm going to leave it there tonight. I'm going to ask Michael to come back out and uh, sing whatever he wants to sing with us this evening. Did you, did you like that video that we ran before the service? <laughs> I loved it, man. That's, I, I love your song, man. So let's pray together. Um, oh, Father, we learned so much from these men and women that we're studying. And we learned that they're just like us. And that there's nothing about you that's ever changed. The God that you were for them is the same God that you'll be for us. And we see all the hints of the gospel all over, Lord. We see the need in, in the brokenness of man, the inability of man. We see the threats around us, Father. Every, everywhere we go, we see your righteousness, your goodness, your ability, Lord, your capability and your fierce loyalty to us, Lord, and your, your fierce love for us. Thank you for being faithful to your promises tonight, Lord. And I just pray that you comfort my, my brothers and sisters here as they rest in your promises, Lord, and run to you instead of to Egypt and tell the truth in, instead of making up some comfortable little couch of a lie. Help us to, 
to, to, to rest, Lord, in, in your righteousness. And please make us more like you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. I want to say to you tonight before you go out that if you're in one of those impossible situations right now that is scaring you about what might be around the corner, God's arm is long enough to reach you where you are. And against all odds, he wants to break through. You've got to give it to him tonight. You've got to tell him tonight that you trust him. If you want to come up and pray with uh, uh, the guys that are up here, you're more than welcome to do that. But take some time tonight before you leave to give that fear or to give that temptation to God or to give the failure to God. If you've blown it, like, you know, like Isaac did, she's, she's not really my wife. Whatever, whatever it is, bring it to God, ask his forgiveness, and receive his forgiveness. The favor of God is not a hard thing to get. You don't work for it. You don't buy it. You turn to him, and he gives it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To all who believed in him, to all who will believe in him, to them he gives the right to be the children of God. That's favor. That's favor from God. Walk in that favor. Grace and peace to you tonight. If you need prayer, come on down for that. Bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.